Good morning. Isn't it always such a joy to be in the house of God? You know, we uh, we do say that a lot, but uh, you do understand, you do realize that we bring the house of God with us, don't you? Mm-hmm. We are the temple, right? So, whenever we come together, we get all of these temples together, and His Spirit resides with us. He comes along with us. I was just reading the scriptures that was up there, said, talking about entering into His gates with thanksgiving. And into his courts with praise. And oftentimes, there again, we have the picture, the mental picture of coming into God's house, coming into the church. But there again, whenever we realize that we are the temple, then we enter into his gates with thanksgiving into his courts with praise. So how and, and where does that come from? It comes from within. It comes from our hearts. It comes from uh, our, our spirit. And so <clears throat> it's okay, folks. Um, we enter into that realm of praise. We enter into that realm of thanksgiving. And as we do that, there was something spectacular that happened because another in scripture in the word reminds us that he inhabits the praises of his people. He lives in it. He dwells in it. He delights in it. And so as we come before him and, and, and as we have done with with thanksgiving, making our requests known to him, with prayer and supplications, but also entering into the gates, thanksgiving, entering into the courts, praise, entering into the holy place, reverence. You see, this is not just a gathering. Oh, I love our name. I love what God has given us for this particular body as a Christian gathering. But there are so many places, so many um, congregations, if you will, that only meet for a gathering. They only meet for a status in the community. They only meet so that they can look good to everyone else and say, oh yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm a good man, I'm a good woman. But that's not what God desires. He desires first to come into the presence and come into his courts, come right straight up to the throne room. And as the scripture says, that we are able to come boldly before the throne. Boldly. You know, <clears throat> whenever we realize who we are, we realize that we have that connection with him. We have that that. Uh, familiar, and I don't mean this as far as in dumbing down, but, but we know who our Father is. We know what our place is. We know what our position in Him is. Then we have all uh, of the freedom, the freedom to just walk right into the present, and, and our, our hearts are joyful, our, our, our vocabulary is thankful, and, and we come before him, and, and we know that as a good father, 
that if we, as, as human fathers, if we know how to give good gifts unto our children, then how much more, the scripture says, does he give good gifts unto us? I mean, isn't that just a wonderful reassurance? Knowing that we don't have to, 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 to come to him like this. We don't have to come to him like this. We don't have to come to him on hands and knees, crawling in shame. But we come to him with the assurance in our heart, with the assurance in our, our, our spirit that whatever we ask, whatever we ask, if it's for our good, he's going to say, okay. That sounds like a good idea. I, I, I believe that you're. I believe that you're ready for that. I, I believe that you're capable of handling that. See, we go to him, and, and, and whenever we come before him in that manner then he knows, I mean, we come to him with full of faith, full of uh, 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 thanksgiving, full of praise. I mean, what kind of father could turn that down? He wasn't, he doesn't, because he loves us. <clears throat> so let me encourage you, first of all, with that. Whenever we come together, and we come to pray, we come to uh, 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 be in his presence. Just be assured that you can come with boldness. Just be assured that you can come with all confidence of knowing that you are received. Knowing that your petition means something to him. He's not a father that's up there just wanting to say, no, 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 you can't do that. No, you can't have that. No. <laughs> no, he, he wants us to, to be enough in line with his will and in line with, with his purpose that whenever we ask that it is something that is going to be beneficial. And if he says no, I mean, it's for our good. If he says wait, it's also for our good. If he says yes, but not now, I think that's the answer that my grand boys hate to hear from me the most. Yeah, we, okay, all right, we'll, we'll do that, but, but not just yet. You have to wait a little bit. Oh. I think sometimes we would rather hear no than to hear wait. But that's our human nature. That's, that's the way we are. So, <clears throat> what the Lord has been working with me about is that very thing. Is who are we? Who are we? In Proverbs chapter 20, <clears throat> we've been doing something at my house that, uh, that, we, that used to be a regular for my family. And, and um, <clears throat> so I was, you know, prayed about some things here a while back, but the Lord reminded me of that. And so um, this here is something that you might want to add to your daily devotions, you see the book of Proverbs is uh, sometimes one of the most overlooked books in the Bible. But it's so full of knowledge and wisdom and, and instruction and, and things that will keep you out of trouble. So, Proverbs has 31 chapters in it. Well, guess what? Most months have 31 days, right? So, just take a day 
And, and whatever you're reading as your regular Bible reading, just just add this to it. Just just read a chapter in the book of Proverbs every day, every month. Just renew it, and I promise you, you will find so much food, so much uh, instruction, so many things that will help you, so many things that are so practical. But here in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, the Lord says, The human spirit is the lamp of the Lord that sheds light on one's inmost being. So, whenever we think about who we are, a lot of times we think about, well, you know, I, 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 I am me. I'm who I am. I mean, uh, you know, you've heard people use that excuse because, hey, I, I have a temper because I'm Irish. You know, I'm stubborn because I'm American Indian. You know, uh, how, many, how many of you have heard all that kind of excuses for behavior? That's exactly what it is. It's an excuse. It's something that you tell yourself so that you can... Uh, you know, have a reason to get by with it. Have a reason to not deal with it. Have a reason to not want to change it. Because after all, it's in my DNA. <laughs> Wrong. It's in your heart. It's in your spirit. And the Bible says that the human spirit is a lamp of the Lord that sheds light on one's inmost being. Now, we know that the Word of God is the light and the lamp for us. He says, your Word is a light into my path, a lamp into my feet, or vice versa, whichever it is. Okay? He gives us illumination through the Word. He gives us what we need to shed light. But the Lord also has a light. He also has a lamp to, to, to know who we are. And that's our spirit. Our spirit. What, what is our spirit? Let me give you, let me give you uh, an example this way. <clears throat> we oftentimes think that we are a body going through this life with the brain with the mind. Now, some of you may have to go on and chew on this for a while before it actually makes sense, but we are not a body with a mind. We are a mind clothed in a body. You see, all the body does is obey. All the body does is follow through. All the body does is, is just to react. Now, in that reaction, there's a lot of things happening. There's a lot of, uh, of electrical neurons firing and all the thought processes. And I'm not a scientist. You'll have to go listen to Dr. Caroline Least to get all the scientific uh, facts about how the brain works and how the mind works and how many uh, thoughts can be processed in a millisecond. I don't have all those answers. But what I do know is the fact that our bodies simply react to what our mind thinks. You say, well, what's the difference between the mind and the brain? And the only thing to say, no, no. Your mind does things like calculations. You know, if you want to do, if you figure something out, you sit down and you calculate it. But your mind is what is the motive behind you doing whatever you do. Your mind is the one that makes the decision. Now, the Word of God also calls it the heart. Well, guess what? I, I, I didn't mean to say that. I, I didn't mean to do that. Well, hmm, there's a scripture that comes to mind that says, out of 
their heart, the abundance of the mouth speaks. Uh, let's put it this way. You squeeze a lemon, what are you going to get? <laughs> yeah. The juice is going to come out, right? Why is lemon juice going to come out? Because lemon juice is what's in there. Now, we have a problem with that. Because once we understand that what we do in this physical what we do in this body, we no longer have an excuse for. We can't say, oh, well, <clears throat> I know I really, really, really hurt their feelings, but I, I didn't really mean it. Okay, well, what happened? You got squeezed. What was in the heart came out the mouth before all those firing electrons had time to say, stop. How many of you have ever been there? Have you ever known anybody that always came up to you now? Now, I don't mean this bad, but You know what's coming after that, right? Going to be something bad. Going to be something negative. Going to be something non-productive. Going to be something disparaging. Going to be something critical. But I don't mean this bad. Out of the abundance of the what? The heart. The mouth speaks. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about your inner man. I'm talking about the thing that needs more control than this outer man does. You see, what we see and what we behold is what the outer man does. And, and, and what we judge about people is what we see the outer man doing. But what's at the root of it? The inner man. The inner man. Well, okay. So how do I conquer this inner man? What do I do about this inner man that gets my outer man in so much trouble? Hebrews 12 gives us a good word on that. My wife told me it was biblical for me to get up and make the coffee because after all, Hebrews. Anyway. Okay, <clears throat> this is not the scripture I was actually looking for, so I wrote the wrong one down. But the scripture is, I beseech you, therefore, that means I beg you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. And be not transformed, I mean, and be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, what chapter am I in? Hmm. Anyway, <clears throat> I 
think that's actually Romans 12, possibly. So, by the renewing of our mind. So, how do we go about renewing? Okay. Renewing is something that happens on a continual basis. We were talking last night, and we uh, had a time of prayer and, and a time of, of coming against some really, 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 really tough thing. I mean, uh, there was a, a group of us, and, and within that group, there were, I want to say, maybe six, at least six or seven uh, people that we mentioned who were dealing with cancer. And cancer is an awful word. Cancer is an awful thing. Cancer is a terrible thing. But one of the things about cancer is the fact that cancer is simply a cell that is not doing what it's designed to do. Because all of the cells, did you know that, that you do not have the same body now that you had a year ago? Oh, you said, wait, wait a minute. Now, let's see, I still got all my fingers and all my hands. I feel the same. You know, I might fluctuate a little bit, but, you know, it's the same on me. No, it's not. Because every cell in your body is designed to do the same thing that we are designed to do, and that is to live, to die, and to be regenerated. So, you do not have all of the same cells in your body now as what you had a year ago. Which means that, in a scientific sense, you are not the same person. But a cancer cell is a cell that refuses to die. And then, it not only refuses to die, but it starts feeding on the other healthy cells. Hmm. Have you ever heard of sin alluded to as a cancer? It is. It's something within us that sometimes, despite our best intentions, it simply just wants to refuse to die. Now, I know, okay, I know I've been to the cross. I know that I have accepted the Lord. I know that I have asked him to forgive my sin. And I heard that the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if I confess my sin, he is faithful and he is just and will forgive my sin. And not only that, but he will also cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I know that I can take that to the bank. I know that I can stand on that and know that my sins are forgiven. So what does that mean? How come we still have to deal with this cancer of sin sometimes that, that just refuses to die? Well, we have to be renewed. We have to be renewed. Now, this is something that I learned from Pastor Pam. Thank you, Pastor. We're praying for you. We hope you feel better. But whenever she taught on this, I had, I mean... You would have just had to mop up all of my brain cells off of the floor because it was a, a spiritual, mind-blowing experience. How that whenever she talked about whenever Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he was dead. And Mary and Martha said, Lord, you should have been here four days ago because by now he stinks. And Jesus said, don't worry, I am the resurrection and the life. 
Oh, I know, I know that in that day there's going to be a resurrection. We know that, yes. But that wasn't what he was talking about. Just like we do today. We think we have all the biblical prophecies all figured out. And we think we got it all lined out down to uh, 88 reasons why Jesus is going to come back in 88. Oh, and then next year we have to print a retraction of 89 reasons. I'll tell you something funny regarding to that. I had no clue about that going on. No clue, not at all, none. We had a radio broadcast at our church. My sisters and I, we sang on there regularly. And the day before that was supposed to happen, we got up and we sang without any knowledge. We sang, we're here today. We'll be gone tomorrow. And this life won't even be a memory. (laughs) Had no clue. So, we don't always have everything figured out the way we think we do, do we? But, we have people that have been to the cross. Lazarus, come forth. They come out of the grave. Oh, I'm saved. I'm sanctified. I'm on my way to heaven. But they're still bound. Wow. Now, the amazing thing was about that message was the fact that Jesus did not go to Lazarus and start losing him. He turned to the disciple and said, loose him and let him go. What does that mean to us as a church? That means that there are people that only you can lose for one thing. There are people that only you can help. But the second thing that even more important than that, in order for you to lose someone else, you have to be loose yourself first. What am I talking about being loose? I'm talking about the mind. I'm talking about the spirit. I'm talking about the inward, inward man, the inner man that does all of these things that the outward man manifests. You see, God said, Jeremiah 29 and 12, one of our favorite scriptures of a lot of people that, you know, you find it on Bible covers, you find it on plaques on the wall, you come to our house, you'll find it at least once or twice. For I know the plans that I have for you, saith the Lord. Plans of goodness. Plans to prosper you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. But can I tell you that some of you are so wrapped up in your past. Some of you are so mentally and spiritually wrapped up in in what somebody did to you way back there. You're so wrapped up in what you did way back there. You're so wrapped up in your feelings of insecurity way back there that God is saying, I want to give you a future, but I can't give you a future if you're still stuck in the past. I can't give you a future if you're still bound up with what uh, uh, has, has been bothering you. If you're still bound up with what somebody else did to you, what somebody else said to you, how somebody else put you down. What's the problem? We're driving down the road and we got our eyes glued to the rearview mirror and all of a sudden, bam! 
we have a collision. Why? Because we should have been looking out the windshield to see what God has for our future instead of being glued to the rearview mirror. What is that? That's your inward man. That's all those things that you allow to camp out in your mind. Well, how do I overcome that? You take it to his spotlight. First of all, you recognize, you acknowledge that, hey, I am powerless to deal with this on my own. Now, I'm going to say something here that's going to fly in the face of some teaching. But it's also very, very, very important what you say to yourself. How you talk to yourself. What your self-talk is. Are you encouraging yourself in the Lord? How many times can we go to the book of Psalm and we read the first three or four verses of a chapter and, and David starts out so depressed. He starts out so down in the dumps. He starts out down in the gloomy. And, and, and we start reading there and we say, my goodness, what's wrong with this guy? And, and then we start reading a few more verses down and then he says, but my hope is in the Lord. My hope is in him that is my shield and my buckler and my high tower, my strength. And then by the time we get down to the end of the chapter, he said, well, bless the Lord. Whoa. I mean, by the time we get down to the end of the chapter, he's also talking to himself. And he's saying, soul, that's the inward man, soul. Why are you disquieted within yourself? Why are you in the mullet grubs? Why are you in this position? Do we not also face those times? Do we not also get those situations where, you know, we wake up that morning and, oh. Can I ask you a question? What's the difference between a Monday and a Friday? Nothing. The same sun shines on a Monday that it does on a Friday. The same birds are out there flying around on a Monday as they do on a Friday. What's the difference? It's what you tell yourself. Oh, I hate Mondays. Well, you just set yourself up for failure out right there. Am I telling the truth? What's the difference? The difference is the way we allow our mind to operate in our spirit, and our spirit follows through with our body, and our body wakes up aching and, and groaning and saying, Oh, I wish it wasn't Monday. And then Friday, we're like, Hallelujah, it's Friday. Bye, Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Okay. So, what we tell ourselves has a big difference with our whole outlook on life. Where does that come from? Our inner man. Our inner man that he wants to renew. How do we get renewed? We get renewed through his word and through his spirit and coming into his presence with singing and into his court with praise. That's not just on Sunday mornings, folk. That's every morning. We take this temple and we get the flesh by the nap of the neck and we say, flesh, you're going to live in the spirit whether you like it or not. Whether you like it or not. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving 
and enter his courts with praise. It is a choice. It is a decision. And it's up to you to make the right decision. So, getting back to what I said was going to be slightly controversial. Those of you who are involved with your addiction recovery, I understand if we do not acknowledge a thing, we cannot deal with it. Is that correct? We must first acknowledge who we are, what we are, what we've done, and how bad it is. But can I tell you something? If you continually tell yourself that I am an alcoholic, I am an addict, I am this and I am that, and you continue to live that label, you will never get over the addiction that you need to get over. You'll struggle with it. You'll make strides with it. You'll go through all 12 steps. Whoops. Here we go again. And I know, I know that you're supposed to do this. I know that you're told to do this. And I know that it's part of the program. But at some point, you've got to be, have the courage and the fortitude to get up there and say, I am an overcomer. I am a recovered Addict. I am a recovered alcoholic. I am a recovered fill in the blank because I don't do this on my own. I do this by the power and by the strength of Him who is renewing my mind and renewing my spirit and renewing everything that is within me on a daily basis. You say, well, I, okay, I, I don't really agree with that. Let me ask you a question. Whenever I preached the last time, I talked about the lame man at the gate, beautiful. And Peter and John said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. Well, what did he do? He went leaping and praising God and into the temple, and he caused a great disturbance. May I submit to you that he never referred to himself as the lame man again? Who are you? Oh, I'm the lame man. What? You don't look lame to me. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, but I am. I was down at that gate for 38 years. I'm the lame man. You just can't tell it. No. He had a different identity. He was no longer a beggar at the gate. He left those beggar's robes at the, at the gate. And he left that identity behind So, what are we talking about? Same thing. The inner man. The inner man. Okay, well, Brother Gary, I don't, I don't really feel like that I'm all that renewed just yet. Well, <laughs> can I encourage you with something? All of your cells in your body don't all become new at the same time. Let that sink in. You see, we don't say, okay, I got this body, and then in the next second, boom, all of our cells are renewed, and we got a brand new body. Uh, no, that's not how it works. But as you go, and as you live, and as you uh, exercise, and as you feed yourself good nutritional food, every cell is in a process of being renewed. And this process, every cell is in a different place of the renewal cycle 
then another one. So, whenever we are being renewed, we have to understand that it's not something that happened just instantly. But as the Apostle Paul says, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. It's something that I daily strive for. It's something that I daily put my attention on. You see, if we would put less attention on this flesh and blood, less attention on, on the outward, and more attention on the inward, then guess what? This outward would heal. This outward would live longer. If we get the inward with the way that it needs to be and we start dealing with old things of the past and we do as the word of God says, what happens whenever we come to Christ? He said, old things are passed away and behold, all things become new. If there's ever a scripture that we need to get down into our spirit, it's that one right there. Old things are passed away. Somebody treated me awful. Old things are passed away. Somebody assaulted me. Old things are passed away. Somebody did me wrong. Old things are passed away. Somebody betrayed me. Old things are passed away. Somebody divorced me. Old things are passed away. And all things become new. The things that we go through are often not necessarily the mountain. But it is the mountain that we make of it that is the problem. I'm just going to let that sink in. Yeah, what happened to you was bad. But you're not the first and only to go through it. You were sexually assaulted, assaulted by your own father. Go talk to Joyce Meyer. See what she's done in the ministry and in the kingdom. You were in an abusive relationship and were, were, were beaten and, and, and mocked and cast down. Go talk to Juanita Bynum and let her tell you how that the Holy Spirit can bring you out of that. It's not the mountain of the thing that happened. It's the mountain that we make of it in our minds. And it's how often do we decide to keep going around that same mountain, keep going around that same problem, because we won't let it die. Have you ever seen anybody who loves self-pity? Oh, it's miserable. <laughs> Got the plum disease. Poor little old me. But they find themselves wallowing in self-pity. And the more they wallow in self-pity, the more they enjoy it. You say, well, I don't think they enjoy it. Spend some time around them. Find out what their favorite subject is. I'll tell you that they enjoy it. Because they talk about it all over and over and over and over 
and over. You get the picture. What is that? Is that really a problem that we can call a mental health problem? Yeah, okay, let's stick a label on it. We have a label on it now. But can I tell you that at the root of it, it's a spirit problem. It's a spirit problem. Am I trying to say that mental health issues do not exist? No. But there's a root reason somewhere. It didn't just pop up for no reason. So, what do you dwell on? What does your inward man dwell on? What does your inward... Oh, I know, I know. We're all, you know, we're together here. We're family. We're believers. We come together. We worship together. We pray together. We cry together. But who are you when you walk out that door? Who do you allow to speak to your mind whenever you walk out that door? Are you allowing the word of God to renew you? Are you allowing the thoughts and failures and pain and disappointments of the past be a continual loop over and over and over? And over. I'm trying to help somebody today. There's victory. There's victory. There's victory. Zig Ziglar said, You need a checkup from the neck up. But he also said this You can change who you are, you can change where you are by changing what goes into your mind. The inner man, the inner man. We need to be renewed daily. We need to change our focus. We need to take a shift from the rear view mirror to the windshield. You see, God had a bright future plan for the nation of Israel. A bright future. A future of, of, of overcoming. A future of having their own place, their own land. But unfortunately, he got them out of Egypt in one day. And it took 40 years to get Egypt out of them. To whom are you listening? To whom are you listening? Where's your focus? What are you thinking about? What are you allowing to haphazardly come up into your mind? You know, we think about also, people that hold the watch up, and hypnotists, is that how you say it? We think about those people and we think, oh, that's mind control. Whenever we engage, no, let me rephrase that. I thought it'd say we engage in mind control every day. But the problem is that we fail to engage in mind control. You see, God gave you a mind. He gave you a spirit. But he also gave you the fruits of the spirit. And one of those fruits of the spirit is self-control, temperance. 
Yeah. Brother Gary, you mean I have control over all these raging thoughts? That you, yes, you do. You just don't do it. You, you mean I can handle all the stress that, that, yes, you can. Don't give it so much of your time. Don't give it so much of your value. Don't give it so much of your energy. You say, well, Brother Gary, you don't know my mind. Have you ever got one of those little rubber balls out of the gum machine, gum ball machine? I don't know what they're made of, but whenever you throw one of them things, you have no idea which way it's going to bounce. <laughs> those things are a lot of fun, but whenever we've got something like that going on in here, that's no fun. And that's what the Bible says, the peace of God, the past, that's all understanding. That's what the word of God says, pulling down those imaginations. Taking captive those strongholds. Yes, I know some of these things have been in your mind. They've been in your spirit for so long that they've become a stronghold. But you know what? There's victory for any stronghold at the cross. There's victory for any uh, uh, vain imagination at the altar. But first of all, we have to do exactly what all of you that are in 12 steps know. We have to first acknowledge that we have a problem. You see, I'll tell you where that American Indian pride will get me. Yeah, I'm proud. I'm Cherokee. What about it? Nobody's more stubborn than I am. And then what? Well, my stubbornness will get me in trouble. Because what is stubbornness? I'll tell you what stubbornness is. Idolatry. Idolatry, that means I think that I know better than my maker. That means that I think that my way is a better way. Another scripture comes to mind. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. death so we need to get pride out of the way we need to get stubbornness out of the way we need to get the reluctance to take a good look at ourselves our inner man oh we know all about that man in the mirror but how much do we know about this man right here? We need to know enough to know that we take those inward things and we bring them to the spotlight of the word and we say, Father, if my inward man is not matching up, is not lining up to what your word says, I want to be renewed. I want to be chained. I want to be set free. I want to be delivered. I know I'm saved. I know I'm sanctified. But I'm tired of being bound. Amen. I want to be free. And you know what? He said, ask. And you will receive. 
Seek, that means you might have to ask more than once. But if you'll seek, you'll find. And knock, that means you might also have to ask more than twice or three times. But if you keep knocking and you keep working on that and you keep bringing that to the Father, what's going to happen, you're going to turn around one day and realize that, hey, where did it go? I don't even think about that anymore. That, that, that stuff that used to bother me so much doesn't even bother me anymore. And I even, didn't even realize it. How did that happen? One day at a time. One prayer at a time. One time after time of bringing our thoughts under subjection and pulling down those strongholds. So who are you? This is not who you are. This is who you are. Amen. Pastor Gary. Oh. All right. Um, well, that's all I have. If anybody else has anything else, speak now and for heaven, hold your peace. Oh. I heard that somewhere. So, one way, I will say this, one way to control what goes in your heart and out your mouth. Is to actively control what goes into your mind. And if what is going into your mind is becoming a problem to you, you need to change stations. I'm not talking about just on the radio or just on the television. But that's also true, you know. If you're getting depressed and you're getting all downhearted because you're sitting here listening to tear in my beer, then, uh, you know, maybe you ought to reach over and change that dial just a little bit and uh, find something that speaks to your inward man. If you're listening to a uh, news talk radio, uh oh. Should I? If you're listening to news talk radio all day long and you can't figure out why you're so uptight all the time, then maybe you need to change the dial. Okay, I'm done. <laughs>